Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice stretch and are ready for the, I guess, the, I guess the last leg of the conference where we have panel discussion and uh, a few more lighter, lighter segments to engage in. I I don't know about you, but I kind of I'm feeling there are just so many thought bubbles popping up in my head of things I thought I knew, which I'm now reconsidering, things that I've been inspired by, and the the good news is there's still more to come. So. With that said, let's get on to the next part, which is a panel discussion. And the panel discussion is going to interrogate the concept of innovations in language service and aged care. So there is so much happening in this space, and we're delighted to have four amazing professionals in this, in this area to share with us their views and some learnings and also take some Q&A. So again, I'll please invite you to, if you can, ask questions in the, the lower section of below your screen where I think you can see my face. There's, it says questions and there's a there's a question portal there specifically for uh, the speakers relating to the presentations. Um, on the right side of your screen, it's more of a you know commentary that you might have that's a little less, less formal. So if you wanna have um, any questions on this topic, please, please ask. This is a great opportunity. You have a captive audience of some amazing talent and you really want to leverage that as much as you can. So our first panellist is Dr. Katrina Long from the School of Primary and Allied Healthcare at Monash. She's a mixed method implementations and health services researcher in the School of Primary and Allied Healthcare at Monash. She's passionate about generating and translating high quality research to make a difference in the lives of vulnerable Australians. To achieve this, she favours approaches that partner with stakeholders and consumers to create useful interventions that work in the real world. Our second panellist is Jim Lavach. He's a senior lecturer in translation and interpreting studies at Monash. He's also a certified and practising interpreter and a translator with 20 years of field experience in health, legal, educational and welfare settings. His research work includes studies on how users of services locate and work with interpreters and on uptake rates of interpreting services across different settings. Our third speaker is Jill Frame. Jill is the Deputy Researcher of Australian Health Research Centre at CSIRO. The, uh, AE, the, this, this particular centre is the leading national research facility applying information and communications technology to improve health services and clinical treatment for Australians. Jill's got significant research experience in the development and validation of digital health services lifestyle interventions and recommender systems. She's worked with Australian and international industry partners to create engaging and sustainable health tech solutions, aimed particularly at encouraging individuals to change the way they engage with health, their own health. And the final panelist is Emiliano Zucchi. He's the director of the Transcultural and Language Services Department with the Narun Wilkin Aboriginal Support Unit at Northern Health. He's got extensive experience developing policy and implementing a diverse range of services in the health context. He's also responsible for his organization's cultural responsiveness plan at the Northern Health Reconcil and the Northern Health RAP, the Reconciliation Action Plan. So between the four of them, there is a wealth of talent to be mined. And I'm going to welcome you all first um, and ask each of you to give a brief introduction about how innovations in language services and particularly your project and its importance in aiding communication for older people. So I'll give you a few minutes each um, and I'll start with you, Jill. Thanks, Tasneem. Um, so the Australian eHealth Research Centre is CIRO's eHealth um, digital arm. Uh, we are engaged and directed by um, projects that help in the digital transformation of the healthcare system. Everything from interoperability, smart homes for aged care, health services um, and evaluation. So the project that, that I'm here to talk to you about today is called Cald Assist. It's a project that we built, uh, a technology that we built with um, Western Health in Victoria. It, it started off as a bit of a pet project, but it's actually had significant impact, um, especially over the last um, six months. Cald Assist is a freely available um, mobile app, um, tablet and phone, Android and iOS. And I think um, Lisa was going to share a link in the chat um, so people can have a look. Um, it's an app that was developed by clinicians around cl clinical need. 
Um, it's an app that is uh, designed to be used in the absence of an interpreter. So while waiting for an interpreter or if it, um, outside interpreting hours. And it was designed for the hospital setting, but it's got a, a range of application areas. And, and again, we're seeing a lot of that over the last six months. And uh, the app itself is, um, is preloaded with content. It's got about 200 phrases and questions that are used in a variety of clinical settings. So it was first designed to be used in allied health services um, where um, question answer um, uh, in discussions were needed. So do you need help to swallow? Do you need to go to the toilet? Do you have any pain? Where is your pain? How long have you had this fever? So questions that um, have kind of solid answers. So we stayed away from psychology and other areas where you can't really have a, a, a short, sharp conversation. So it's designed by clinicians who said, here is my typical interaction with an individual as a physiotherapist when I arrive at the bedside. And um, each segment is broken down into a range of um, communication sections. So it starts really importantly with an introduction. Hi, I'm your physiotherapist and I'm here to talk to you about your walking. And um, would you, would it be okay if I use this app for our communication? So it sets a scene. It allows the individual to understand what's about to happen. And um, podiatry in particular, when someone arrives with a scalpel at the bedside, people really want to understand where they're going. So we, we worked with clinicians around their typical engagement sessions um, and a way of understanding. So then you get to ask questions to the individual. The answer options are contained in the app visually. So you can hit the yes, no, you can tap the days of the week or the numbers. Um, or So it takes away that need for gesture in those um, circumstances. There's follow on questions and then a closing statement. So here's some information that I want you to remember, you know, you know, please don't get out of bed without without assistance. And um, please drink this when I when I provide it. And um, I will be back with an interpreter. or I, I will be back later in the day. So a way of closing off that conversation. So the person feels not just that they've been interacted with, but they've actually had communication that's rich um, and engaging to them. So we, as I say, we developed with the occupational or with the allied health team in Western Health, and pretty soon once we related um, into into service and we tested it and trialed it across Western Health hospitals, the nurses popped their hands up and said, "Hold on, we have this need over here, which is actually really engaging, and we don't get as much access to interpreting services. So we have more questions that fit this this response in this library that we would like added. So we did a second round of the project funded by Better Care Victoria, and which allowed us to add a nursing module. No uh, surprises when COVID hit last year, there was a real need for communication with people who arrived at the hospital for testing, at drive through centres and at walk-in centres, to be able to ascertain information about um, their symptoms and how long they'd had those symptoms for. And again, to give information that is around, you know, you must go home and isolate um, and be able to give that in a culturally appropriate way in a language that was understood. And so I guess the whole aim of the app was to increase confidence in communication and um, in the absence of an interpreter. And um, the app is locked down, the content is fixed. And um, so it's quite safe for use um, in that environment. It doesn't need Wi-Fi. So if you're using it in, a, in an area where you don't have um, really strong Wi-Fi, it operates in that mode. Um, and so it's been a really interesting journey for us. And um, we, we wrapped up the end of last year with an endorsement from New South Wales Health. So the app has been um, endorsed by New South Wales Health with material um, created to promote its use. And because it's been scientifically validated, because it's safe for use, and because it had the content that was relevant for scenarios of use within New South Wales Health. So we've had over 2000 downloads um, in the six weeks after that endorsement. Um, and so we know this app has traction um, within the system. We're very keen to look at um, how the platform could be used in aged care more broadly. It is already available for use and can be used, but actually we would like to, to get into the nitty gritty and understand what's missing from it um, within that aged care sector. Thanks, Tasneem. Thank you. Thank you so much for that one. Um, the next question I wanted to ask will be to, to Emiliano. Um, oh, sorry, Emiliano, before I do that, could you also just give us just a, a small, just a very brief in a couple of minutes, tell us, give us an overview of your project and its importance in aging, in, in, in aiding communication for older people, please. You're on mute, Emiliano. Very ironic. Uh, <laughs> afternoon, Tasneem and colleagues. Um, first of all, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. 
and pay my respects to all this past, present, and emerging. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, our project at Northern Health, which is the department, one of the departments that I manage, starts from the proviso that policy says that patients uh, have a right to access free professional interpreters um, because we know that um, professional interpreters are fundamental in looking after our cold communities. So, <clears throat> um, in order to implement that policy fully, historically, uh, health services relied on agencies for interpreters. At Northern Health, we decided to um, to, to do things a little bit differently and shift demand from agency to in-house. Um, by having more in-house interpreters, uh, access uh, was uh, greater. There was greater access to uh, uh, interpreters and more prompt access to interpreters. Um, so that's the first thing we did uh, at Northern Health. And we grew in the space of 14 years from four in-house interpreters in four languages to almost 50 interpreters in uh, 17 uh, languages. Um, over the same time, demand for interpreters grew from 15, just over 15,000 appointments per annum to almost 80,000 in 2021. So a, a massive change, as you can see. Um, but we also decided that providing interpre interpreting services by itself was not sufficient. So we added other portfolios. Uh, first and foremost, we added our medical translations. Uh, which were developed in collaboration with consumers. Then we added transcultural training for clinicians. So we trained clinicians on how to effectively work uh, with interpreters and how not to stereotype and not see communities as, um, uh, if you like, uh, all in one box. Um, uh, then we also changed policy to make sure that research projects undertaken at Northern Health included patients who required an interpreter. Because previously, those patients were being excluded from research projects. And as a result, that research was not representative of the catchment we uh, serviced. Uh, and another thing we did is we welcomed students from uh, Monash and RMIT universities. And this gave us the opportunity to help shape the interpreters of the future, but also to give the students the opportunities to experience interpreting in a real medical um, setting. Um, we also had to do other things. We had to align language services with other departments to put them on the map, so to speak. Uh, uh, interpreters was considered just bilingual people. You know, if I find one, I'll use one, otherwise, bad luck. Uh, we wanted to professionalize interpreters as much as possible and their role uh, as part of a multidisciplinary team looking after uh, the patients. Um, Unlike other health services, we decided to also look after cultural diversity. So uh, the language services department also developed and implemented successive cultural responsiveness plans and was responsible for uh, cultural competence and cultural diversity at Northern Health. Um, one of the other things we did is we run patient surveys every couple of uh, years. So we partner with patients to try and understand what the needs are. Uh, and in short, uh, all these strategies resulted uh, not, not only in much um, greater access to uh, interpreters, but also in improved health outcomes. So we know, for example, that in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, the gap in length of stay between patients who need an interpreter and those that don't need an interpreter has halved. So in other words, patients stay a, a lot less uh, in hospital compared to uh, 2007 when we uh, started with this. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emiliano. Look, um, and finally, um, Jim and Katrina, between the two of you, can you just give us a bit of an overview about uh, what your, how your project led communication? Sure. Uh, so Jim and I both work on a project called Practice. Um, and the aim generally is to understand the experience of linguistic discordance for residents with limited English proficiency living in the non-ethno-specific aged care facilities. So I suppose we're at the completely opposite end of development from Emiliano and Jill that we're trying to just understand what the current experience is. Uh, so in 2019, we conducted a range of interviews with residents with limited English proficiency, their family carers and staff at a couple of aged care facilities in the southeast Melbourne region, uh, and then did a qualitative analysis of that. And it was really interesting experience. We found 
um, that this linguistic disconnect led to this cycle of failed communication, which I'm sure probably doesn't surprise anyone, that residents would try to communicate their needs often that would be perceived as increased behaviours by staff. Staff would withdraw, residents would try to respond, family members would be brought in to mediate that relationship, which over time led to the residents completely withdrawing from trying to actively communicate. Um, we also found there was this hierarchy of communication strategies where most staff saw believed that direct communication or verbal communication wasn't necessary in the language for that resident. Instead, gestures would be sufficient. Um, sometimes picking up an individual word in that language or using cue cards was sometimes used. But there was this really strong belief that, oh, they might not even understand anyway because they might have dementia. So there's not really any point in engaging in a verbal communication with them. And there are a couple of examples of some reasonably significant negative outcomes for residents based on this lack of trying to communicate with them in their language. A lot of them then became socially isolated um, and it was really only for legal matters that the interpreter was even considered. And staff just said they didn't even know that free interpreting services were available or didn't know how to access other ways of communicating with their residents. Jim? Just to, thank you, Katrina. Just to take up from there, that, that's right. The, the study was a small study, but it was very uh, insightful in that it gave us um, a first-hand view of really what happens. Um, there's increasing numbers of people with limited English proficiency now entering non-English, non-ethnic specific aged care facilities. We often think that there are ethnic specific uh, aged care facilities which will be there, which will pick up um, the needs of these people if they do need to go into a particular type of accommodation. For lots of communities, they don't exist. Um, and even if they do exist, they might not be in an area which is, um, which is familiar or accessible for the family. So Really, we have across all sorts of aged care facilities a very large a heterogeneous group of, of, of residents. Um, with aged, with advanced ages, et cetera, there are, there are communication challenges which can occur, such as aphasia, uh, loss of language, reversion to the first language, even if the person had acquired English reasonably well during their time in Australia. Um, and as Katrina said, there's... Um, the, the ability for a person who's a resident to communicate effectively, not only with staff, but other residents, is was, was a real eye-opener, how impoverished the type of communication was. Um, I've worked as an interpreter for over 20 years, and I've done hundreds of jobs, and I can probably count up on two hands the number of jobs that I've had at aged care facilities. Now, I know that interpreters um, can't be called in for every possible interaction that a resident could have, let's say, with a staff member or with administration or what have you, but we have excellent policies in this country. We also have excellent availability of services. There's a link which I've provided to Lisa, which gives information about what the federal government, the Department of Health's policies and accessible services for interpreting services are. And basically, the level of service that is available for aged care facilities for using interpreters is very comprehensive. Um, just to list um, some of the packages that it does cover the community uh, continuity of support programs, CHSP, home care packages, um, residential aged care, short-term restorative care, and the types of interactions that interpreters can be requested for um, include the following, care needs, service and preferences of the clients, fees and charges, uh, review care documents, etc. So basically there are so many possible interactions that are covered by the services and the services are re really quite underused. Um, and as Katrina said, there's a reliance on family members. Uh, family members, that can have good as well as not so good uh, aspects because it can encourage a reliance on the family members to simply be the, the, the troubleshooters in all, in all respects. Uh, family members are certainly supportive in most cases, but in some cases they may not be. Uh, there can be issues in terms of the, the resident's privacy, the re resident's own um, desires, et cetera, or preferences. Um, so what we see is there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, um, we also found cases of, as Katrina alluded to, ageism, where there were beliefs that um, how much does it really matter that we are able to communicate effectively with residents, et cetera. 
Um, so it was a mixed, a very mixed bag, and we're hoping to uh, further this research in the post-COVID uh, era, where, as you, as we all know, communication channels and mediums have changed once again because of restriction of movement and, and access, what have you. Thank you, Jim. Um, this is clearly a topic that's that's of, of a great deal of importance and certainly um, affects a lot of the, the people now in, in our audience today. Um, I'm conscious of the time and that we have a lot to get through in the next few minutes, but I'm, I am going to ask if you can, if, if it's possible to limit your responses to a minute. Um, it's a huge ask, I know, considering the questions, but Jill, could you explain how your project stands out in relation to other forms, digital forms, for people who speak languages other than English? I think the key one, Tasman, is, um, is safety. Um, so the content that is in our app was um, has been used professional translation services. It is double checked by interpreting services. So it's a combination of of the different skills that are involved and typically in, in that space. And, and that content is locked down. So there's no room for error. Other translation apps like Google um, and others have, have an opportunity for error. Um, especially in medical translation so that's a key differentiator for us also it's multimodal it plays this, it plays the audio you can read it it's written in english and in the home text so and um, for people who are hard hearing or hard vision or not literate in their home language it gives different options okay that's that's very very a lot of adaptability there um emiliano your your approach to language services has been integrated into policy and practice within northern health can you comment on why it's important to consider language services within an organisation that services the needs of older people? Um, because it makes a difference. Uh, we know uh, research is fairly clear. Um, uh, we need to start from the point of view that we all um, have equal rights uh, and should all have equal access to uh, or equitable access to uh, services. And we know that language services make a huge difference to patient uh, uh, health outcomes. Uh, and therefore it's, uh, it's only uh, right and fair that we offer the same service to, uh, to all patients. Interpreters do bridge a communication gap, do bridge the uh, cultural gap, uh, and they are essential both for patients and clinicians. Beautiful, thank you. And to Jim and Katrina, I mean, your research seems to be one very, very little undertaking so far in this field of investigating language services in residential care. Um, given that we know there are so many diverse people in care, why do you think it's been this way? I think part of the reason we found was in our qualitative themes that we identified. So both staff and the family carers found verbal language communication as a low priority. They much they focus more on basic daily needs, medication, then being comfortable and not about communicating with that person. So even when choosing an aged care facility, often they picked one that was closer to home where they could pop in or they liked the facility versus one that offered any support for language communication in that person's native language. And we also mentioned the ageism was a big barrier in even this research. So this is one, of, this is the first in Australia where we actually talked to the residents and it was difficult getting carers to agree to us to talk to the residents. We got a lot of them saying, oh, but you won't even find an interpreter that will work in their dialect because they speak this old dialect of Italian. And then we got an interpreter in and the resident was easily communicating um, with the interpreter. It was really lovely interactions. Like to see that using interpreters really worked for these residents, even ones with reasonably advanced dementia, where mm -hmm. the family said, oh, they won't be able to say anything meaningful. We managed to have a really useful, meaningful conversation with them, albeit shorter than other conversations, but they still had capacity. But a lot of the time that was written off um, by the managers at the aged care facilities who didn't want us to talk to those residents, their families, and their families saying, oh, no, there's no point in talking to these people. Wow. Jim, did you want to add to that? It, yeah, it is challenging in that there are some barriers that we have to overcome and it's it's not easy to overcome some of them. For example, the management of aged care facilities, they've copped a lot of criticism over the years about a number of things. There's been a number of scandals, etc. So they're understandably a little bit reluctant about allowing researchers to, to enter their premises and to conduct research. As Katrina said as well, if there's a power of attorney or, or if, a, if a child or a carer has um, makes decisions about what happens to a resident, it's often hard to secure their consent. Um, so they are a hard group to, um, to reach in terms of gaining data from. Um, it's important though that we do get to them because their voice is, is often not heard. 
Uh, we do hear, it's much easier to hear the carers, to hear the, uh, the facilities managers or staff members voices. Those are very important voices to hear. But the, I mean, it's all about the residents. They're there. It's That's what it's all about. And um, they are hard to get. But notwithstanding that, we'll be looking back, um, look, looking to be able to reach um, further groups, et cetera, to, to continue this because this is an under-researched area. Mm, massive data deficit there too. Look, I'm going to pivot to a final question. Um, given the time limitations, but I think it's really important. In terms of future directions for your project, um, can you tell us what your vision might be for your project in the next couple of years? And again, within just a minute, if that's possible. Jill, I'll start with you. Thanks, Jasmine. Um, we would really like to, to look at what this uh, project needs in terms of, of aged care specific content. Um, we also need to look at what what the use model is in hospital, you see someone for a number of days, whereas in aged care, it's a, it's a different type of, of conversation and communication. Could the app be used as a training tool to increase, you know, the kinds of words and phrases that the carers can actually use themselves? You know, if you've got a, a population um, of Italians, maybe you pick up a few phrases and you could transfer the app usage into, into real usage, those kind of things. So it'd be a really interesting environment to play in around what the long-term effects of that kind of communication might be or the uptake of it or lack thereof. In that environment. Well, thank you. Emiliano, what are, what are the future projections uh, for your particular uh, I think that uh, in northern health, 20% of appointments have an interpreter. Uh, that's not the case in every hospital. So I would uh, auspice and hope that soon every hospital offers an interpreter to 20, even 25% per, uh, percent of the pop, uh, patient population because we know that that's what the need is. But we also What's need the current to... rate at the moment? We, I'm not sure about other hospitals, but at Northern Health is 20%. Um, uh, we, we need uh, also the, to bring together uh, research so, um, uh, and technology. So all this, the, the three go together. We can't uh, separate them. Uh, we need to invest in technology, invest in research, and continue to offer equitable services to everybody. Thank you. And uh, lastly, Katrina and Jim, what are the future projections for your project in light of what you found out so far and where you'd like to be tracking? In terms of project, we did have phase two interrupted by COVID, which was to better understand um, what communication strategies staff were using for residents and coming up with a framework to help us identify those interventions that fit already to help match staff with interventions to match their deficits and to find where we need to develop stuff. So Jill's um, app would fit perfectly in that new framework. Um, and I'm working on establishing a residential aged care research network in the Mornington Peninsula region to bring together all of the aged care facilities to help identify local priorities for research, including um, further work in the language area. I know Jim has some ideas on services that need to change too. I've got lots of ideas, but if, <laughs> if we've got one minute left, um, I might <laughs> also segue to what Jill had said as well, because we know that so many, I mean, people across all sorts of service industries are using uh, apps. And there are lots of translation apps, etc. And um, we suspect or we know that very often staff in aged care facilities, if they can't communicate and they're in a jam, what do they do? They reach for their smartphone and see, can this offer anything? Now, we want to see how was the incident? It's against policy at the moment, but we know that people are doing it. Um, Technology is moving, but not. It's we've got problems with voice recognition. We've also got problems if a person is able to communicate to a resident, and then they get the response from the resident, and they can't understand the response. What response? What do they do with this? You know. So technology is still getting there. Um, we want to see how much people are using it, what they are able to do, uh, honestly, and um, and to see things uh, from that perspective. Can I just ask while I've got you there, Jim, um, Maria, who's one of uh, the, the participants in this particular project, she's just said, how do I get involved in this or in this, in this kind of work? I've just, I'm just finishing my dip, dip, I suppose it's a diploma in community services and would love to help out and find work in this type of area. Any, any tips? So when Maria said she wants to find work, she wants to in the in the aged care facility. And in, in, in aged care, language provision and developing communication. Is there anything niche that you might be able to suggest? To for her to contact know? us, <laughs> and we can probably yeah. give you some tips. Um, um, uh, maybe if we you know find out a bit more about exact, exactly what she wants, if she's very welcome to contact us, um, Maria. So yeah, we can we can take it from there. 
Please, I think that that would be a great idea. And in fact, I mean, we can use the Connect Now function to do that. And certainly both Jill and Jim and Emiliano and uh, Katrina, all their, all their details will be made available to everyone to, to follow. Guys, you're doing some incredible work in this field. I think it really cuts to the heart of communication breakdown when we don't have the agenda and the and the resources in place to actually enable it to, to flourish so kudos to all of you to for the work that you do in this space i want to actually i do want to end with a just i think it's very poignant to end with a statement maria made to this issue which i think demonstrates why you do what you do she wrote my mum was in aged care for nearly four years i kept on asking about organizing a companion that spoke italian maybe for a few hours a week their response was very disappointing and basically no companion was ever organised. Also having staff that understood her would have made such a difference. I kept asking nothing, but nothing happened. Mum has since passed away. I am now finishing my dip in community services because of this type of attitude within the aged care sector. So, I mean, my heart goes out to, to Mara, sorry, not Maria, Mara Pigato. Um, deepest condolences for your loss, but um, let's hope that through your experience and through the work of these panelists, things can get better for the next for the next generation. Thank you all for your for your time. I am going to to wind this session down and um, yeah, encourage participants to certainly get in touch with them through the portals um, that we've made available. But I, I would like now to have a short break of again just a couple of minutes, a momentary stretch before we dive into what might be, I think almost one of the final two sessions for the afternoon. So thank you very much. And we'll see you in about uh, five minutes. Thank you. Thank you.